Welcome to Direction Northeast. Hello, I'm Jerry Arbor. This program is a presentation of the Mass Communications Department of Northeast State Community College and is produced by the students through the college's video production facilities. This series of programs is designed to bring you the student perspective on events and happenings throughout Northeast Tennessee. The program is a part of the classroom and laboratory learning process for students in broadcasting and advertising public relations, part of the mass communications area. Since the white men set foot in the Western Hemisphere, the Native American culture has experienced much change. With much of that change came great pain. In this episode of Direction Northeast, we'll meet a Native American poet who has chronicled much of the good and bad experiences for his tribe. I don't train like you. I don't have the same skin as you. I don't wear my hair like you. I don't dance like you. I don't come from the same place as you. But I will give you CPR. When you help the American Red Cross, you help America. Essayist and poet Jim Northrup of the Anishinaabe Indian tribe has drawn from a well of personal experiences, some wonderful, others horrible, to become one of the most respected contemporary writers of American Indian literature. Well known among the Native American press, Mr. Northrup has won many awards and recognition for his writings. Welcome to Direction Northeast. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. So why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about your life growing up? Okay. We'll start at the beginning. I was born at a very early age at the government hospital on the Fond du Lac Reservation. I'm one of 12 children uh, because it gets real cold in northern Minnesota. So we have large families to heat the house. Uh, at the age of six, I was sent to a federal boarding school some 300 miles away from my reservation. It was the policy at the time, continuing the Captain Pratt policy of kill the Indian, save the man. So I was one of the last that actually went to a federal boarding school. At first I thought it was going to be a grand adventure. I went down there with my older sister Judy and we had never left the reservation before so it was all new to us. We were separated as soon as we got to the school. She walked on the sidewalk to the girls' dormitory, and I went to the boys' dormitory. I was six years old, and as we were going down the stairs, stairs of the school bus, the kid in front of me slipped, and I grabbed him to keep him from falling, and I said, hi, a typical Ojibwe expression, which means, like, too bad, or I'm sorry for you. And the house matron, who was supervising the uh, unloading of the bus, heard me say that, and she came over and twisted my ear. I thought she was going to twist it off, but she twisted my ear, and she said, we don't speak that language here. And I was six years old. I said, what's language? I didn't know what she meant. But gradually, over the years that I spent at that boarding school, I quit using Ojibwe and began using English. What? were your expectations? I know you were very young leaving the reservation, but what did you feel like life out of the reservation would be like? I didn't know. I had no idea. And I learned very quick how to fight. Because I was one of the youngest and smallest, I got a daily beating from the big guys. I learned to fight back because crying didn't stop the beatings. Even if I cried, I'd still get beat up. So I learned how to fight back. I was in 38 fights by the time Halloween came, and I'd won two of them. Not a very good record, 38 and two. I got into a fight with a boy in my class, and we fought after the noon meal. And I won the fight because I made him cry before he made me cry. And he told his older brother about the fight, and his older brother, who was two grades ahead of us, told me we'd fight after school. And I was really scared. I don't think I learned anything that afternoon because I was just scared of the fight that was coming. And so I was really scared. And when we started to fight, I fought as hard as I could. I ignored my swollen lips and my bloody nose and just kept swinging. 
the fight seemed to last a long time. Finally, after I got in the lucky punch, the bigger boy started to cry. And the big guys dragged me off and said I won the fight. Well, I was kind of happy about that. And then he told his older brother, who was four grades, five grades ahead of us, and I had to fight him. And I remember getting in two punches before he pounded me in the ground. And uh, laying there crying on the floor, I learned how to diplomatically get up. How do you get up after you've been pounded into the floor? I found a crack in the floor and I'd follow it with my finger, follow it along with my finger until pretty soon I was on my knees following that crack. And then I was on my feet. And then I'd say, ah, I don't need that anymore. And I'd walk away on my feet again, ready for the next fight. Now your boarding school, what was the ratio of Native American to white? Did you have to deal with diversity issues a lot there? We were all Native American. Well, actually, Native American is kind of, it means uh, anyone who was born in America. So uh, it was all Anishinaabe and Dakota people there. There was uh, no white people at all, except some of the teachers and some of the administrators were white. But all the rest of it, the cooks, the bus drivers, they were all from the state of Minnesota. Did you have to deal with a difference between tribes, or did everyone get along pretty well? Uh, I think we were all in the same boat, so we got along pretty well. But we had our individual differences, and that's what led to the fights. Do you all speak with the same language, or are they different languages between the two tribes as well? There's different languages. Uh, Dakota speaks different than the Ojibwe, our language. Right. Well, language is said to be a mirror of culture. How do you feel that your language is unique? You know, what makes it special? Our language is very precise. It's uh, got a musical sound when it's spoken. It, uh, it's, it's pleasing to my ears because I heard the old people speaking all the time. And so I am relearning my language. Assimilation didn't work with me. I'm living my life as my grandparents and their grandparents did. What are your favorite parts of your tribe's culture? Storytelling is a good part. Now, I've heard that storytelling is incredibly big in Indian cultures. How do you feel that uh, storytelling is being portrayed today? Do you feel like it's a dying out form of art, or do you think that we're still doing OK with it? We're still, doing, we're still doing great with it over the kitchen table at the, when we're boiling maple syrup, when we're parching wild rice, we're telling stories. And it, it, it's alive and well, and it continues to be a learning tool and also a source of humor. Because sometimes things are so bad, you can only laugh at them. Right. For example, all that story I told you about fighting, I look at my grandson now, who's six years old, and I think, he's just a baby. No wonder I lost so many fights. <laughs> I don't think you realize how young you are until you grow up, huh? Right, Absolutely. right. So you're a very experienced, well, everything, poet, essayist. You're, um, you've been on many YouTube videos when I was doing some research on you. I saw many CBS productions. You're also into film. Why don't you tell me a little bit about all that? Hmm. Well, my first video experience, I think, was called Warriors. It was put out by PBS in Fargo, North Dakota. And it was a story of Native American Vietnam vets and how we're readjusting to society. So that was the first time. And I did a little thing down in St. Paul called Zero Street, where I played the part of an Indian activist. And since I was uh, both Indian and an activist, it was a stretch, but I thought I could do it. Then I was in a Disney film called, what is it called? Dog Sled Movie. I played the part of an Indian laborer. And once again, it was a stretch, but I could do it. And then uh, two guys followed me around for five years to get a year in my life. and. That one was called Jim Northrup with Reservations. And so that ran on PBS for about three years, I think. 
and won numerous awards. And then I was in another one called Way of the Warrior. Patty Lowe from Wisconsin Public Television put that together about Native veterans. And she said, I'm her second favorite veteran next to her dad. And I like that. Now, out of all of that, what would be your favorite and why? Well, I did another one called White Man's World. It was a, a little independent film, and I played the part of Jim Northrup. <laughs> Easy part to fill then, right? Yeah, I rehearsed on that one a lot. <laughs> so what, in your CBS production that you did, what exactly were you doing with people following you around? Oh, I showed them how I make maple syrup every spring, how I spear fish, uh, and then in the summer I show them how I make birch bark baskets, show them how to peel the bark and bring it home and make baskets. And then in fall, it was harvesting wild rice. And then in the winter, I took them on a moose hunt and it shows us killing a moose and hoisting it up on top of my old Buick station wagon. It caved in the roof, kind of, because it was such a big moose, bringing it home. I also took them to the wall in Washington, D.C., where I recited some poetry there. So. You are a very inspirational writer. Where did you get your inspiration from? Actually, my grandfather was a writer back in the 1920s and 1930s. And I like to think that he broke the trail for me, to let me know that it was possible to be a writer. And we were not uh, looked down upon from the outside community. Right. So you were a very fought for soldier and Vietnam. I was How, a Marine. You're was, a Marine? Yeah. Very nice. See, I didn't know that. Tell me a little bit about your experiences <laughs> out there. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about your experiences out there. I know that um, it's very hard times, but from what I read about, you got a lot of inspiration for your writing, and it was a very expressful nature for you to be able to write about those experiences. I was troubled by uh, what is now called post-traumatic stress disorder. I had it before it had a name, uh, before it was recognized by the medical community as a, as a real live uh, problem. And so I found that by talking with other veterans and also writing about some of the things that I seen in Vietnam uh, and my experiences afterward, uh, that helped me a great deal. It cut down on uh, the nightmares I was having. It uh, made it easier to face the day because I could just uh, write a poem, get it in a book, and then close the page on it. <laughs>